Our guest in this segment is Delegate Chuck Kirst from the 95th. Chuck, good morning to you, buddy. Thanks for coming in today. Good morning, everybody. And uh, I was noticing the admiral over here while while you were talking. He was just in his own little world looking at that tablet, <laughs> smiling. And I don't know where he was no, no, at. No. I was, I was I always, Chuck, listen intently to what the boss says. So... And uh, body, I may not body called during the break. <laughs> body called during the break. He's <laughs> contemplating his attack very strategically. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> Chuck is the chair of the Natural Resources Committee. He's on energy and manufacturing, finance, jails and prisons, and uh, workforce development. And a couple of those uh, committees were very busy uh, during this last legislative session, uh, Chuck. But the question that has to be asked and answered first has to do with Brad Knoll and the firing range in Berkeley <laughs> County. <laughs> Government works very, very slowly, <laughs> Brad. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure what else now. to tell you. Uh, yeah, maybe by the next term. Hopefully, we hopefully we get some news yet this year before next session. Hopefully. Yeah. In regards to your chairmanship of natural resources, uh, is there any other additional news uh, that came out of the committee this session that we need to relay? Uh out of out of natural resources committee. Yeah. Um. Oh, geez. Uh, I, I can't particularly think of anything off the top of my head, but That's everything fine. everything runs together after you're down there for a while. That's fine. No, no biggie. We're good with you there. Uh, obviously, finance was very busy because you guys have to fit all the tax bills in, and you were very interesting because of the competing tax plans. There wasn't a whole lot that could get through finance until you figured out exactly what the money situation was going to be. Yes, and, and finance was kind of a bit of a learning experience for me this session, for sure. Uh, a lot of time in finance. The f- probably first half of the session was really budget hearings, uh, and that w- that's all the agencies coming in presenting their budget and uh, the different different personnel there that you can call up, question, ask questions about about the budget and what have you. Uh, so that was a learning experience, and then kind of a, lo- a lot of supplemental stuff, sup- uh, appropriating some small, mostly small small amounts of money there in the beginning. And then the budget bill, and uh, we went over that and approved that. And, of course, that was just kind of the first shot against the bow because we know that it's going to the Senate. The Senate's going to make some changes. And then anything that's done in the legislature would have to be incorporated into that at the at the end as, as well. Jails and prisons. We've discussed this with Speaker Hanshaw in the previous segment here. This is obviously not an ideal scenario right now where you have National Guardsmen uh, j- doing the the bulk of the work in the jails and prisons around the state. So here's kind of a, a, a off the wall question as it regard in regards to this. Did the money that the governor sent to Marshall University for the baseball field, I think it was thirteen, fourteen million dollars, some people say ten, whatever the ultimate number was, did that affect your ability to appropriately staff jails and prisons in West Virginia? I don't believe that it did I believe that was money that was appropriated to the governor's office, um, and, and and I don't know what the fund is called. There, there's so many of them go through my it's head. The special right fund, now. right? Yeah, but uh, I believe that money was already previously appropriated to the governor's office. Uh, now, could he have used that towards the jails and prisons? Yeah, I, I would imagine that mm-hmm. yes, he could have. His critics said that that money actually came out of an appropriation that was specific to the Department of Corrections, though. And that I'm not actually aware of. I, I don't know. It, it Perhaps it was. I, I, I don't want to speak on that because I actually don't know. Okay. I think when you look at one big piece of pie for the state and the budget for the year that the governor proposes, I think that, that carves out a, a special part of that so that you're not going to, as a legislator, have that much to work with as long as you're looking at the governor's budget. So if he's pulling that out for that ball field, but you, you're naturally not going to have that that you can say, okay, we can use this mount to go towards your correction field or where else where else you need to use it. Um, so, yeah, I think that would be, from well, my way of looking at it anyway. Actually, I think there's a complicating factor here. Uh, the money was uh, part of the Arbor money. Uh, the governor loaned the receiving agencies a certain amount of money and then they they were paid themselves back uh and when they paid themselves back they felt they did not have any strings attached and they could then give it to marshall university so there's a little bit of washing the money there that i don't think was totally appropriate so uh good okay uh 
Chuck, there's one of the bills that passed. You probably anticipated that I would raise this one because I've raised it two or three times, but I've never attributed your name to it because I did not think it was fair. But now that you're face-to-face, I'm going to do it. And that was uh, uh, House Bill 2007, the gender reassignment. Uh, That was the one that the initial version said there could be no surgeries involved when an adolescent, we're talking about adolescence folks, uh, could be no surgeries involved uh, to transfer from one gender to the other. Well, in West Virginia, it's my understanding, there has never been any contemplation of a surgery surgery involved. Another component of it was the hormone blockers, which is my understanding that the hormone blockers, you can take them for years and not have any permanent results uh, or permanent impact so uh, that you could uh, so if you took them during your adolescent years and then stopped taking them in your early in your 20s, there'd be no effect whatsoever. Uh, Fortunately, the Senate took out the hormone blockers, but the House had it in there. My my concern, Chuck, was that we're dealing with a population of young adolescents. All of us, when we went through our adolescence years, knew it was one of the most difficult times of our life. We had is a maturation process. It was exceptionally difficult. But I can only imagine those poor individuals that are having gender identity problems uh, and with the peers, with themselves, how do they deal with it? And then have the legislators shine a spotlight on them and saying, you are evil, evil people. We're going to, you, I'm sorry, you did not use those terms. That was, I, I embellished that. Sorry. But you, we're, we're going to shine the spotlight on you and we're going to take away any medicine. Your parents are not going to be involved in this discussion. Your doctor's not going to be involved in it. You're not going to be involved in it. It is our legislators prerogative to, uh, to, uh, uh, not to let, allow you to have these hormone blockers that might make your life a little more easy. Now, pardon me for for ranting, uh, but I really felt that was probably the most insensitive bill I have ever seen come out of the legislators. So your chance to uh, to give your version of it, and I've, I've done my rant. I'll not I'll not say anything more. Okay. Ever uh, or, or just right now? Uh, no, no, I, no, well, no, no, just for this interview. Just for this, I, I've said my right. I'm not going to. I'm not going to rebut it. So I, right. I've made my point. So. Okay. Um, the the short of it is, I, I believe that we're simply protecting children, uh, those under 18, um, and 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 I, and I think everybody wants to protect children. Uh, now, this gender dysphoria, I guess, as it's called. Um, I guess it's very multifaceted. Uh, you perhaps even have some parents sometimes that guide a child into a certain direction. Uh, I, I don't think that we should be doing that. Uh, once, once somebody turns 18 to where they can make these decisions on their own, that they're considered an adult, I, I believe that would be the appropriate time. Uh, these uh, gender gender reassigning surgeries uh, I, I mean they're absolutely per uh, lost, lost my lost my word there they're ac- absolutely permanent and not reversible now the uh, the hormone blockers um, I'm not a scientist or anything so I really truly don't know but I've heard testimony both ways as you described it and I've heard testimonies that that these are the same drugs that they use for uh, uh, um, chemical castration so if, if that's the case I mean that becomes permanent uh, and and uh, without being a doctor I have to rely on uh, myself personally I have to rely on testimony from those that are in the know and you have conflicting there so myself personally I, I, I err on the side of safety for the children and protecting the children uh, so so that's kind of where I come down well, I don't know if that answers your question totally or not well, uh, no, it does not, but I appreciate your response to it, and as I said, I'm not going to go do well, point counterpoint. Well, Bill, what, what was not answered, maybe for the, I don't want okay. you to take a vow of silence yeah. on this for the sake yeah. of it, but what okay. was not answered that well, you want answered? Well, the, uh, the, again, the surgical aspect of it, uh, if it was being practiced in West Virginia, then that would be a valid argument, or if it was intended to be 
uh, practice in West Virginia. But I've heard from the medical profession there has never been a single case of surgical uh, gender change in West Virginia, nor has there been any contemplation of it. So to me, that is just kind of uh, something thrown on the table that did not have a lot of merit to it. Now, the hormone blockers, uh, and Chuck, you, you probably were exposed to a more to different views than what I have been, and I'm not a doctor. Uh, I what I've read of it though, it it is not permanent. Uh, if it is a chemical castorization, then I applaud what you did. I would be very much against it. But I have not heard the hormone blockers been anywhere close to the chemical castorization. I just again I I. And I saw someone said I'm uh, I'm a little more left on this issue than I should be. I guess I may be a little more left, but I'm trying to put myself, and it's a long time ago, of uh, the problems that these kids have. They every every teenager has a suite of problems. Some unfortunately have larger problems than than their peers do, and I think it's our job to try to make their life a little bit easier and to be a more accommodating and more understanding as opposed to cast them in the light of, of, of something that society does not want. Well, I don't totally disagree with your last thought okay. there as, yeah. as far as casting somebody yeah. Yeah. into a light that, yeah. uh, that becomes very uncomfortable. Sure. I, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, but but to uh, whether this is being done in West Virginia or not, I believe West Virginia was uh, getting set up to start doing some of this. Were they? I had not uh, heard my, that. My, okay. my understanding from uh, testimony down there is that uh, WVU had some sort of a um, – uh, 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 what's the word I want to use here um, – program set up that – I'm not saying that they were doing this just yet – but they had a program set up for this that could easily lead into where they where they would start doing doing uh, the surgery. As soon as you mentioned WVU, because the WVU, the chief of one of uh, the department that's involved with the with the juveniles, adolescents, uh, was the one that went on record, uh, a lady, by saying West Virginia has not been involved in this, nor do they have any intention of becoming involved in it. So that was the lady in charge of that segment of WVU, and she left a strong impression they had nothing they were not planning oh. to do anything. I, I, I applaud them if, they're, yeah. if they are not doing it and have no intention of doing it. I, I, I do applaud yeah. them. Um, and with that being said, this is still getting out in front of an issue that is taking place in other states. And just because perhaps it's not in West Virginia yet doesn't mean that it's not coming to West Virginia. Bill Kearns. I am. Um I'm glad you're here this morning, and and I, I'm, I'm not going to run the rabbit that Bill already did this morning. Although I, and I my thought process and is I very wanna, similar. I, I want to applaud Chuck for yes. coming in, and I want to applaud Chuck for listening to my rant. And I thought his response was a good response. So, I well, well, thank you. I, and and you know, I'm I'm always willing to listen to anybody as as long as they're being somewhat civil and reasonable. <laughs> well, that was a rant, though, Chuck. <laughs> that, was a, that, was, that was a rant, as Rob would be proud of. <laughs> All you had to do. Was mention Hillary Clinton and I've been with you, buddy. <laughs> well, I um, and I listened to what you'd said about um, and and this, I wasn't running this rabbit, but I just want to add one comment um, about the gender reassignment surgeries. And you'd mentioned about parents leading this, and, and you know, as a minister, I will definitely tell you that many things are led by parents and not by the children to have this done and at some point in our lives we need to make sure and 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 tell people they need to quit trying to prove god wrong because basically that's what they're doing um so yeah bill so I, i'm glad you said what you did because i was right in line with you there and um you know i i, I we've talked a number of times about the peia issue and the pay raise issue, um, and some some of the for the, some of the workers within the state, if not a large portion, this amount of the money that was in being financed, you all were very instrumental in making this happen as well. The twenty three hundred dollars, I think people need to realize that also that the the employees of the state aren't necessarily getting that twenty three hundred dollars, or it will be encompassed with the increases of PEIA. Um, that twenty three hundred dollars is is per person, correct? 
um, that was given. Employee, yes. 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 Um, So that, then they have to take off the consideration that a portion of that is also taxes and and fringe benefits. So the employee may not see that extra $2,300 in their paycheck as a net. Oh, you definitely won't because it's going to be taxed. It's yeah. going to be yeah. taxed. So you're, so you're going to see that sixteen to sixteen yeah. to twenty percent just between your your FICA and your and your retirement contributions and 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 things of that and what the what the department has to pay. So I know I, I do the budget for our two counties, um, so I have to put that as dollars in there. But then you're going to t- then you're going to increase your you're going to increase your premiums for PEIA. Um, so the employees are going to see that increase in their sa- out of their paychecks as well but i guess if you want to say are we sowing good seed money i guess the the issue comes back to how do we make and and this is for the legislature how do we make peia more palatable that providers want to accept it because we're seeing across the state more and more providers saying putting signs up we we're not a participating provider with peia but, but anymore I, for time constraints when to cut you there bill let chuck answer the question because we've only got a couple minutes okay that that is a very valid point a very concerning point and we addressed that in what we've done with the peia uh, the big problem with providers not, not wanting to take PIA is PEIA paid 50% of what Medicare would pay. And what we've what we done in the PEIA is we brought that up to 110% of what Medicare pays. And as I understand it, surrounding states, they actually pay in the 160 to 180% of what PEIA pays. So, uh, you know, we're not even matching what surrounding states do. But at least we're getting it back up there now to where uh, we probably should not have any problem with providers not wanting to accept it. Mm-hmm. We see. I, I work for a. Provi- I'm part of a provider that we provide services to people that have insurance. So we see many times people come to the health department to get vaccinated and they have private insurance. And with PEIA, sometimes we see that the what we're being reimbursed from the insurance from PEIA doesn't even pay for the vaccine or the service that we have to provide. Doesn't even make the cost, much less provide any additional markup for uh, profitability to be able to pay for operating expenses. So I think we have to make it a little bit more palatable that people are willing to accept PEIA because they know they're going to be at least comparable to what the states, other states are paying. Um, but then also, again, being able to take care of employees of the state as well i i think most people realize that we had a big problem with peia and 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 it seems to me that the majority are fairly accepting of the changes that 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 are taking place uh simply because they realize that something has to be done something had to be done uh, you know there's there's a smaller group i think that are pushing back it, against it uh that feel like they're, perhaps they're being shortchanged or you know they're, they're losing out uh, but the legislature done, uh, I think, a really good job at trying to address everything and trying to come up with some sort of a program that is going to be sustainable going forward. Uh, I haven't heard a lot of talk uh, publicly about it, but uh, if I recall the numbers correctly, in, uh, in 27, uh, to backfill PEIA was going to be, I think, $433 million mm-hmm. in the, the year 2027. I think that's what uh, Senator Eric Tarr told yeah. us somewhere, somewhere in that range there, give or take a few million. Yes, right? and when you're talking about hundreds, I mean two or three million is not a big deal. I yeah. guess. That's what Bill says all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he tells me that daily. <laughs> Chuck, we got a final minute coming up next. Hang tight. 